Welcome to the 902 podcast, the official podcast of the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm Captain John Vick, and I want to thank you for tuning in. This podcast will give you an inside look at LSL with topics and guests to discuss public safety issues impacting Lancaster County. Be sure to subscribe for highlights on news cases and the people working for you at LSO. You can also follow us across social media by searching for at LSO Nebraska. That's at LSO Nebraska on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Welcome to the 902 podcast. We are in studio today with Sheriff Terry Wagner, Chief Deputy Ben Houchin. How's and, Friday? And 901. 901 is on the 902 <laughs> podcast today. It's on my badge. It, yeah. yeah. This, is a, this is a first. Uh, you are officially the first sheriff, uh, other than Sheriff Wagner, that's on the 902 podcast. So we're, we're, okay. we're very fortunate to have Sheriff Aaron Hansen from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office today. Thanks for being here, Sheriff. Yeah, no problem. 901 on the 902. Yeah, yeah that's there, right. There we go. We, I should have had a little thing made up for your microphone, you know, just that, that's how we would have known seating arrangement stuff. If I could, <laughs> could have done that. Well, next time we'll put that in the suggestion box, okay. but, um, Sheriff, we just appreciate you being here and, and we obviously, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to looking at two sheriffs. This is the, this is the, this is weird for me. Um, a Sheriff Hanson, we're, uh, we're just, we're lucky to have you here, but before we get dive into, everything about your office and the, the great stuff you guys are doing up in Douglas County. We want to learn a little bit more about you. So sure. where, where are you from? How did, how did Sheriff Hanson become Sheriff Hanson? Yeah. Born and raised in, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. Um, uh, my family originally hailed from South Omaha. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so when I was born, we, uh, grew up, uh, around 44th and F street. Um, and then uh, right around probably fourth grade, uh, my dad moved us down to Texas for three and a half years down to Houston area. And that was fun, but it was we needed to come back. We, mm -hmm. we missed family, and so uh, when he moved us back, we moved up into uh, North Omaha area, so Florence Ponca Hills area. Uh, attended uh, Nathan Hale in, or Nathan Hale Middle School and North High School. Uh, spent some time at University of Nebraska Omaha, and it was right around that time I fell in love with law enforcement. I got a job uh, catching shoplifters at a at a shop go. Okay, um, I don't even think we have those anymore. Um, at a Shopko store in Omaha, met a lot of uh, police professionals that worked there off duty or responded there to uh, when we would arrest individuals, and I, I just fell in love with the job and got hired at age 22, spent with the Omaha Police Department, spent 26 and a half years with OPD and uh, never looked back. So was was being a cop ever on your radar as a kid growing up, or was that something that kind of came up as you got older? Absolutely. Yeah. Not on my radar at all. Okay. Uh, my dad was a chemist. My mom was a nurse. And actually when I was going into college, I was, I went into geology and hydrology. I, I liked that kind of, you know, environmentally based science stuff. And then it just so happened that the job I took to pay the rent, um, as a kid, when I moved out, that ended up falling in love with it and, yeah. and was fortunate. I tested the first time when I was 21, didn't, didn't pass. That was back when we used to have 2,500, 3,000 people applying. Right. And uh, the second time I took the test when I was 22, I was fortunate enough to make the cut. What uh, what kind of career opportunities did you have at, at OPD then throughout uh, throughout your career? Because you didn't stay on the street um, and as a street officer the whole time. No, I, I didn't. I uh, started off as a, as a road patrol officer, street mm -hmm. patrol officer. I worked southwest precinct, northeast precinct. And uh, in 2000, um, I got hired in 96. In 2000, I got selected for the K-9 unit mm -hmm. and spent 14 years on the K-9 unit. Uh, that, that seems like a long time to spend on one specialty, but actually there's a lot of different jobs you can do within K-9. Mm -hmm. um, we had a dual-purpose K-9, so we were assisting with the high-risk uh, entries with the SWAT team, with the Fugitive Task Force, with... You know, the other investigators that were uh, that maybe had a high-risk fugitive in a house, we were doing area searches for armed and dangerous individuals um, with the canine, but then also doing the interstate drug interdiction, mm -hmm. which uh, I really I enjoyed it. I was good at uh, I was good at it, and I really enjoyed asset forfeiture, hitting the drug cartels where you can hurt them the most, uh, taking money out of their pocket and really right. crippling them. Uh, that took me in a lot of different directions. I got to I got to interface uh, a lot with DEA, Homeland Security, FBI. Heck, I got a I got to jump on a DEA plane one time with a duffel bag full of 
you know, five hundred and five hundred thousand dollars in cash and fly it to Phoenix for a control delivery. So they, wow, that was mm-hmm. fun. Then I I got promoted in two thousand fourteen. Um, went back to Northeast Precinct uh, as a street sergeant. 2015, I got selected as a as gang unit supervisor, uh, North Gang Suppression Unit, and uh, ended my career uh, as the supervisor over the fugitive unit for the Omaha Police Department. So what was the impetus to make the switch and, and decide to run for Douglas County Sheriff? That's well, smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to go so, so for for i'd say for about for six of those years of my career i was the president of the omaha police officer association and you know we we really had to uh, that that's when times were pretty tumultuous in omaha both in terms of uh you know the economy but then also police community relations and i think that that really taught me that policing is not just what it reads in the in the dictionary uh, definition of it. You've really got to, you got to be more involved in public policy. You have to be involved in, in advocacy for your people. You have to be in touch with the community and law enforcement is a crucial part, um, of the ultimate solutions to many of the challenges that we're facing, whether it's poverty or crime or human trafficking, drug abuse, mental health. And so, you know, that, that I I got bit by the bug, the, uh, the Mm -hmm. public policy, uh, public problem solving bug. And, and again, I think that that really was formative in my decisions to eventually run for sheriff. And so you were elected, um, I think, 22? Yep, elected last November. Yeah. And sworn in January, obviously. So you're still still finding your way around a little bit, or are, are you feeling better than day one, obviously? You know, I think every, every day after day one is a better day, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing with Douglas County Sheriff's Office, I am blessed with phenomenal staff. Uh, from from the road patrol deputies to the deputies of the courthouse to uh, you know the the guys the guys and gals that wear the gold badges all the way up the, the chain and so they make it easier um, for an Omaha guy to transition over into Douglas County uh, but they're also extremely talented mm-hmm. um, I, I say it often um, I was quoted in the World Herald here recently in a story Douglas County Sheriff's Office is the best kept secret in uh, law enforcement in the Omaha metropolitan area and in eastern Nebraska. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have the staff I do. They, uh, you know, they're, they're the cogs that, that make the machine work. So we, you know, we look at things a lot of times that, that leadership matters and leadership counts and because you have a big part of setting the culture uh, at, at an agency. And so coming in as a new administration, what, what would you say is your, your leadership philosophy as sheriff for, you know, for your people, but maybe also for, uh, for your community members there in, in Omaha? Sure. I think, and that's, I think Sheriff Wagner could probably testify to this fact that, you know, I think that's what's unique about sheriffs is sheriff's answer to the people. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had a, uh, it was an international studies group that came into the Douglas County Courthouse last week, and they were from Eastern Bloc uh, uh, countries, and they could not comprehend that there would be a law enforcement executive in a community that was directly chosen and accountable to the public, not to some other elected official mm-hmm. or not to some other administrator. And, and they liked it. We talked about what that meant and why it was important. Externally, um, what I really enjoy is just being responsive to people. So, you know, obviously we're lucky in unincorporated Douglas County, uh, even though we've had record number of homicides, this year, uh, we still have the ability to really focus on those quality of life issues. Mm -hmm. So when people call and they're like, Hey, I'm concerned about this guy that keeps running the bus stop arm, you know, every day, or this guy's going, uh, 70 miles an hour down my street neighborhood, you can focus on those guys, um, and be responsive to them. And we're blessed to have enough staffing right now to be able to do that. But then internally, in terms of leadership, um, you know, I also want to be responsive to my people because I can be the best sheriff around but if I don't have uh if I don't have staff that are committed to the vision and and the uh the thrust that the leadership um, executive team is focused on then we're not going to be able to accomplish anything Mm -hmm. and so I need to make sure that we're in touch with our people what do they need to be successful how can I support them how can I empower them and how can I make them feel valued as well uh not only feel valued but understand that they are valued we can't do it without them. Right. You know, it always amazes me how, <clears throat> how our staffs 
recognize that we are elected by the people and accountable to the people. And um, for them, that's, um, they really appreciate that fact uh, as opposed to working uh, in other forms of government where you have a number of layers uh, above you. Uh, there aren't any layers above the sheriff. It's, it's the people who elect us. And so that's our, our staffs. They realize that too. And they recognize what a, what an awesome responsibility that is for them. Well, well you're, yeah, you're it, right. It's, it is a responsibility because we have the ability as sheriffs to be a little bit more communicative with the public yep. about issues mm-hmm. that matter that maybe an appointed police chief might not feel as comfortable in being well, or as be, open. Or be told not to say anything about that. Right. And right. Every four years, you guys get evaluated. Yeah, I mean, that's right. You, you'll find out how you're doing uh, during that portion of it. So, yeah, it's, it's a different world on that. But I agree with you. You get to say a little bit more and have your own points of view and and not have to worry about something that somebody coming down on top of you and just saying, no, you can't do this. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that especially when you look back at 2020 and you look at the issues that, that we dealt with in Omaha and you look at the issues that you dealt with down here in Lincoln with the, uh, with the riots, um, you know, we were so fortunate up in Omaha. We had, we had a great mayor, we had a great police chief. Um, we had a good solid sheriff and, uh, you know, people were, we were, we had a really, we had honest conversations in Omaha. And I think that um, that made it easy. And, and I want to make sure as sheriff moving forward that I'm always open to have those honest conversations with the public Mm -hmm. and my fellow elected leader peers as well. And honestly, I think that, um, I think that's, it's new to some people having that, that type of a sheriff that's more involved in those public safety issues on a public level not just on issues that impact the western half of the county, but I think a lot of I think a lot of them appreciate that because we need that balanced discussion. We've we've talked around here sometimes, but we you know we try to be big enough to serve but small enough to care is kind of the the thing that we say and and you know, Sheriff I we were giving Sheriff Hansen a just a quick tour of the office and we're talking mm-hmm. about our, our records division. And I know it's really important to you, uh, for example, even though we're having some staffing issues. Right. But it's important to you to have a human being answering the phone when somebody calls the sheriff's office. And, uh, and I think it's for all, for all the reasons you said, Sheriff Hanson, uh, to be able to have that connection with your elected sheriff is a big deal to people. Well, and that's, I'll tell you what, it wasn't, we didn't walk out of that room and I was sending my, uh, my chiefs a message saying, hey, this is what they're doing in Lancaster County. There's a lot of good reasons to consider it. Let's, let's look at it up in Douglas County because I agree, that's, that's that service component especially when you're talking records, NCIC operators being around 24-7, that's, that's important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's nothing more frustrating. You get on the phone and it takes you 10 minutes to get to a live person. Mm-hmm. I mean, by that time, if you were upset, you're really upset. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, with that, let's move on a little bit to talk about your agency specifically. So the Douglas County Sheriff's Office um, has, has been around for, for probably Longer maybe than than our office, but we're we're some of the earliest offices uh, in Nebraska, I think. Yeah, 1856, and you know we're we're in that county in Nebraska that, you know we we've got the biggest municipality, mm-hmm. and so therefore, you know along with Lancaster County, Douglas County, Lancaster County, we're gonna we're gonna experience those higher level mm-hmm. challenges when it comes to crime or or poverty or maybe political challenges, things like that, but. In Douglas County, and obviously, even though we know in the sheriff's office, our jurisdiction is corner to corner it is. in the county, but we defer to the municipalities when the, to be the first supervi- first line uh, of response and, mm-hmm. and uh, call takers and investigators when it comes to crimes that happen in their in their area. But aside from that portion um, in Douglas County, my agency is responsible for ninety thousand people. Uh, the first responders from the law enforcement um, perspective and also the criminal investigative perspective, 90,000 people. So if you took Douglas County and if you took a diagonal line from the uh, northeast corner down to the southwest corner, that's a pretty good representation. That top half is going to be unincorporated Douglas County um, with some smaller municipalities in there, Waterloo Valley, Bennington, um, that have smaller police departments. The bottom half of that um, of that rectangle is going to be incorporated city of Omaha. And if you took those 90,000 people that live in our part, which by the way, is the fastest growing part of Eastern Nebraska mm-hmm. I mean, in terms of development, commercial development, residential development, 
if we converted those 90,000 people into a municipality, that'd be the third biggest city mm -hmm. in the state of Nebraska. Yep. So we take that very seriously because we need to be responsive. Even though we have countywide jurisdiction, we know we need to be responsive to those folks that live, work, and travel in that, in that part of the county. Yep. Yep. Um, how, how is your office laid out? Um, I know we, we share a lot of similarities, but, uh, but I know you guys have a few different divisions than we do. So what, what is your makeup of, of staff and, and how do you divide responsibilities there in Douglas County? Sure. We've got about 250 uh, total staff in the sheriff's office between civilian and sworn. I'd say we have roughly, we're budgeted for about 151 in terms of our sworn mm -hmm. half. And then uh, the other half makes up our, uh, obviously, our civilian staff, whether it's our law enforcement techs that work in various positions in the in the sheriff's office or maybe the civil proceeds section or our forensics lab. So the way it's broken down for us, we've got a Uniform Services Bureau. That's our road patrol. Um, and that not only contains road patrol, but that contains our new community action team. Uh, community action team is headed by a lieutenant. We have multiple sergeants inside. Those sergeants may uh, handle community responsive issues. Uh, we've got two community action teams working uh, two 10-hour shifts, one in nights, one on the days. Their primary function is to kind of be that safety net for road patrol if call loads are backing up. Um, their second function is to be responsive, proactive traffic enforcement. Their third function is to kind of be the, the sheriff's posse almost when it comes to a uniform function in terms of being responsive to the public on community challenges, whether it's a, a neighborhood complaint or you have a, a chronic problem in a particular part of town with, with speed or something. Maybe, maybe it's even a, a homeless issue. They may come in and help mm. if it's an unincorporated Douglas County or, or assist Omaha with it. We also have a behavioral health unit within that community action team uh, part of Uniform Services Bureau. And right now that's a sergeant and a, uh, a civilian co-responder. So that's our, our Road Patrol Bureau, our Uniform Services Bureau. Our Criminal Investigatives Bureau, uh, that contains our traditional uh, uh, investigators, mm -hmm. which we recently broke into two, two sides. We have a person crime and a property crime uh, team, both headed by a sergeant mm -hmm. that are both commanded by the same lieutenant. Uh, we've got our canine uh, unit within Criminal Investigative Bureau. They do interdiction, road patrol type uh, uh, investigations on the interstate. And a new group called our Special Operations Group. That's a plainclothes group. Um, they are all SWAT team uh, detectives. And again, that's another one of those problem-solving teams. Today, they may be working on a cartel case with the FBI. Tomorrow, they may be assisting juvenile probation with a home visit um, on a juvenile that uh, uh, may be armed and dangerous. Tomorrow, they may be, the, de the next day, they may be assisting corrections on uh, an individual in pretrial release supervision who's not following the terms of his supervision. So they're kind of that really awesome meatloaf of, of law mm -hmm. enforcement, but they're trained, they're mature. They're specialized and they're professionals. And so we, we sleep well at night knowing that they're working out there in the evenings dealing with those most high-risk issues. They may be the one responding to an active shooter mm -hmm. um, as a team, mobilized and ready to go with the equipment and the training. How about your, uh, your civilian side of the house then? Yeah, civilian side, we've got a, we've got a fairly robust forensics um, uh, bureau, a division. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we've got uh, crime scene investigators that not only uh, serve people in Douglas County, but we also contract with agencies outside of Douglas County. So if you're in the Omaha metropolitan area, uh, there's a good chance that you contract with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office for crime scene investigations, where we'll roll out to you, process your crime scene. We just helped uh, Sheriff Robinson up in Washington County with their homicide mm -hmm. that they had, which I, th I just read in the news they made an arrest on. Um, and so they, they do great work. I mean, they're, they're some of the tops in the, in the region when it comes to crime scene investigation. We also have a chemistry lab within there, within the forensics. Uh, we've got uh, a, a, uh, an actual chemistry uh, component that they'll test drugs. They'll do arson testing. We're actually trying to, to see if we can get them to do some enhanced uh, THC, um, you know, THC percentage testing here. We're actually researching that right now. Mm. We've got a latent print section. Uh, we have two latent print um, uh, professionals, and, and that's their whole 
specialty. Anyone can send them uh, latent prints or potential latent prints, try to lift prints off of, of items, and and they're they're not generalists; they're specialists. Mm-hmm. So they, I, I tell you, as a 27 year law enforcement professional that was in criminal investigations for a big part of my career, I'm impressed with these folks. I mean, they can they can pull latent prints off of things like you wouldn't believe. Oh, it's so, a talent. It really is. Yeah. And you got to focus on it. It's got to yeah. be a specialization. Yeah, you can't just do it once in a great while. Right. It won't work. And then obviously round it up with our court, our court services bureau. Mm-hmm. Contained within that is our civil process, uh, you know, our, our warrant team, the deputies and the civilians that secure uh, the courthouse and the city county complex. And so our agency is kind of broken into thirds. I mean, it really does go a third row patrol, a third specialties criminal investigation, mm-hmm. and a third down at the courthouse. And so speaking of down at the courthouse, you do have some of your units split in a couple different um, facilities there within Douglas County. So you have kind of a courthouse downtown, but then you have another um, facility that's a little bit further out west, closer to your patrol area. Yeah, so we've, the, our law enforcement center, and I would call that, that's our central station, is out west in 156th and Maple. And that's, it's easier because that's where road patrol is contained. When it was originally um, built as the sheriff's office, I mean, it was, it was out in the county. Mm-hmm. And obviously with, with uh, western growth of the city of Omaha, now it's actually in the city of Omaha. But it's, it's easier for road patrol to respond from there, obviously, than it would be from downtown in Certainly. terms of hitting mm-hmm. the western half of the county. Mm-hmm. But half of my staff works out west in the uh, in the law enforcement center in 156 of Maple, and the other half works um, downtown in downtown Omaha in the courthouse city county complex. And actually, because we we knew as soon as we the new administration came in, we knew we had to be proximate to both groups. Uh, the county board, great partners to us. Uh, they just gave us a uh, new executive office space downtown in the city county building complex or in the courthouse complex so it'll be easier for us to on monday be out west on tuesday be out east and just constantly stay in touch with our rank and file regardless of what side of the county they work on yeah when you have your when you have your folks at off-site locations um it it's extremely difficult to make sure that they feel connected to the organization correct and uh you know for a while that we had uh, deputies in five different locations when this building was under renovation and it was really difficult to make everybody feel like yep they're part of the organization and we know you're there we're you know we haven't forgot about you and uh so yeah that's yeah that's a that's a tough balancing act to make sure that uh, everybody feels loved well and it and it'll also allow us to be more responsive to the county board yeah because we're responsible for their safety it's, it allows us to be more responsive to the bench to the judges we're mm-hmm. responsible for their safety you know this, Sheriff. We're essentially the U.S. Marshals of, of Douglas exactly. and Lancaster yeah. County. And yeah. so to do that right, we need to be proximate to the people that we serve, whether it's a county board as our peers and partners and, or also the, uh, the judges that, that it's our responsibility to keep safe. If you want a challenging career, a career where you can make a difference in your life, your family's life, and the lives of those in your community, come and join the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. To learn more or to apply, visit us online at www.joinlso.com. So speaking of people, how is Douglas County doing on, on staffing? What, uh, what challenges are you guys having and, and what's working for you maybe? Well, you know, right now we've got a couple. We're, we're very blessed in that we're not as bad off as some some agencies. I know right now, you know, you hear about it all the time in the news. The Omaha Police Department's down 100 officers. That's rough. Mm-hmm. Again, it's hard to do the day-to-day work when you're that short. I think right now in the sheriff's office, I think we, we have the capacity through budgeted strength and positions we need to fill. We're probably looking to hire anywhere from 5 to 10 mm-hmm. deputies. Uh, and, boy, not having those 5 to 10 deputies, it at, at this level now, yeah. I understand it's real. I mean, yeah. not being able to have a body to plug in if you need a new training person or you need someone else uh, mm-hmm. to fill in a spot in the community action team or road patrol. I mean, it gets it gets very real. Well, and as you know, you can't just you can't just pull somebody off the street today and oh. plug them in where you need them tomorrow. I mean, it's a it's almost a nine month process just to get someone from application to where you can get some work out of them. Yeah, for the new hires, absolutely. I mean, it's the new hires. You you might as well get them in the academy and not forget about them, but put them on the shelf in the back of your mind because you're not going to be able to use them for right. for nine months. Yep. We're really trying to renew our 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 scope on laterals mm-hmm. um, and not 
necessarily in-state laterals. I've always had a problem with the, you know, the eating our own, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one sheriff competing against another sheriff, one chief competing against another chief. Yep. We really want to look at how can we expand outside the state of Nebraska. We think we have a lot of good reasons to bring law enforcement professionals into Douglas County, especially in communities that don't value them as much as Douglas County or Lancaster or, or City of Omaha does. I think we've got some real opportunities there. We're going to try to push some real innovations in that area here very soon. Well, and I know we were talking earlier before we went on air, but, you know, the education benefit that's available to law enforcement officers and now their dependents uh, is is a huge benefit uh, that uh, that people can take advantage of in, like you said, communities that will that'll support them. Sure. You know, if I'm an officer in Minneapolis right now, and if I maybe have 20 years or 15 years, if I'm an officer in Memphis or, you know, some of these communities where you see a lot of this constant strife between mm -hmm. the community and law enforcement, boy, if I find out that by bringing my law enforcement license to Lancaster County, Douglas County, Omaha, that that means that not only can I work in dignity uh, for a community that, that respects me and loves me, but you're going to help put my kid through college. I mean, that's we were the first state in the nation to do that. That's big, and that's going to be a game changer, I think, in terms of not only recruiting quality laterals from other states, but diverse quality laterals from other states. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also going to help people go, you know, I'm sitting here, I could retire or I can stay five more years and my, uh, you know, my kid can go to school and I don't have to, you know, he or she didn't have to pay a thing or neither do I. And wow, that that's huge. You know, it just helps make sure that we keep people in the profession longer. Yeah. And that's, and that was such a smart thing for the legislature to do. And that's one of those outside the box, you know, it's, it's, it's tough when legislatures start to say, Hey, I'm going to, pay you extra salary or we're going to supplement your salary. But this is, this is something the state can do to really help, um, help retain police officers. Speaking of where can people go to learn more about that message and the benefits and how they can join the Douglas County Sheriff's office. Sure. It's real easy. Omaha sheriff.org, Omaha sheriff.org. Um, and we've got a lot of different options on there, but one of them is uh, employment opportunities if you click on that, it's not just going to send you to a, a page where you can apply. There's actually contact information for our recruitment team. You can send an email to our recruitment team. And I will tell you, um, our, our chief deputy, uh, Will Nemock, chief deputy over operations, he's, he's the head of the recruitment team. That's how I'm sure very similarly here, you know, administration takes it very seriously. We need to populate our agency with the best and the brightest. But uh, we have uh, our community outreach deputy, uh, Cindy DiMaturco. She's one of our tip of the spear uh, recruiters. If you send an email in or if you send a contact in or make a phone call, you're going to get a call back probably that same day talking about the options and how we can make it easy for you to move over to Douglas County. Well, we're certainly lucky to have a partner agency like the Douglas County Sheriff's Office that we can bounce ideas off, whether it's Hiring, um, you know, I know we've we've also shared some policy stuff over the years. Shortly after your administration took over, I remember we had a meeting um, just about kind of bouncing some ideas around about budgeting and, and what works and what doesn't. Um, so we're certainly um, certainly happy to partner with you guys on on those things. And I know we've we've also worked on uh, some promotional processes over the years. So we're just I know that uh, we're looking forward to, um, to to your administration and and that continued partnership from like you said the two biggest sheriff's offices within the state. Well, and same here. And from my perspective as a, you know, I'm, a, I'm not new to law enforcement. I'm a new sheriff. I feel so fortunate to have a peer, uh, a seasoned peer, one of the most seasoned uh, sheriffs in the state of Nebraska and Terry Wagner, knowing that I can pick up the phone and call him and, and ask him questions. Cause I'm sure if, if it's, if it's going to happen to me, it's already happened to him five times and so it's good it's good to have that resource yeah you, you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel all no. the time if you got people to talk to it's, it's so much easier and you don't have to learn and go through the pain all the time it's sometimes better to get their advice and, and learn from that absolutely you know it's just um it's while we're both autonomous you know uh for our individual counties and and our constituents we also we, we need each other. Uh, there's just no question about that, that we, you know, we draw on each other's resources when that's necessary. And it's good just to be able to pick up the phone, like, like Aaron said, and what about this? Or I need this, or, you know, can you help me with this? And 
Well, it's also big, you know, with the legislature and, and some yeah. of the uh, bills that are coming through is to team up and have two voices of the size of the, you know, the two biggest sheriff's offices in the state being able to come and be speaking together. You know, that holds a lot of water with a lot of people. Yeah, sure. And I know we've we've talked about the importance of just as a profession. I mean, you, you kind of mentioned advocacy. So advocacy for, you know, the law enforcement profession and, and public safety in general. But I think I think it's something that, that law enforcement has I don't know that we've we've done a bad job, but we it, it hasn't always been a priority to uh, to get our message out there and explain to people why we do what we do and why it's important. Well, it used to be, and I remember, you know, back uh, when I started getting involved in, in legislative efforts, uh, back when I got involved in leadership in the Omaha Police Officers Association in the late '90s. You didn't have to work as hard to to help people understand or to help policymakers understand how difficult the job was, why it's important to support victims, why we need to give voice to victims, because victims don't have lobbyists, unlike Mm -hmm. ACLU or some of these other groups that, you know, have Mm -hmm. high-paid lobbyists that will come down to speak out on behalf of the other side of the equation. And so I think now more than ever, especially with social media, especially with so much misinformation and disinformation that goes out about law enforcement, I think it's, it's incumbent on agencies and especially law enforcement executives now more than ever to paint the picture of the reality because it's not just for us. It's not just for our agencies. It's not for us as individuals, as sheriffs or chiefs. It's not just for our staff. It's for the public that we serve. And I think we've seen a lot of examples over the last few years, well-intentioned policies that have not uh, panned out like they were supposed to when it comes to the actual reality on the streets and people have gotten hurt and people have lost their lives. Well, that's a good segue into what we're going to talk about next, which I know are a, are a few um, hot topics that are that are of interest to you and, and your agency at this point. Uh, let's talk about juvenile justice sure. issues. I know that's something that we share. Um, it, it, crime knows no borders, and uh, and some of these problems that, that we're seeing in Douglas County are the same problems we have in Lancaster County. Yeah, that's real, very near and dear to my heart because uh, you know I spent most of the last decade in gang investigations. Uh, with my with my previous employer, the Omaha Police Department. And, you know, I think the day I walked into the job as a North Gang supervisor, I really didn't realize the complexities of it, that, you know, Chief Schmatter does a really good job of saying, look, I don't want you to just solve crime today. I want you to solve the crime you're dealing with 10 years down the road. And so we had to get more engaged in um, working with families, trying to connect them with services, trying to problem solve the issues they had. It walked me down a path where I started getting very involved in reentry efforts and skilled trade exposure efforts, trying to not only help the young people uh, that we were dealing with realize that if they could tighten up their soft skills, get basic job skills, finish school, that they could live in dignity and probably make more than most police officers as a skilled tradesperson. Mm -hmm. Same thing applies for their parents. But once you really start dealing with those issues and you realize that it's how hard it is to connect, if you never came from a lifestyle where you got up at six o'clock in the morning every day and got to a work or job on time at 7 a.m. and you can't be late or else you're fired and put in a whole eight or 10 hour day, People lose sight of how difficult that is for people to just turn a switch and live that type of lifestyle. It's no different than, I think Chief looks like he could run a 5K, but I think you know if, if anyone came into this room and said, all four of you guys right now, go out and run a 10K. Well, I haven't trained, I'm not ready, my knee hurts, you know what I mean? And so it's very similar when it comes to trying to help people from maybe a lifestyle that is not as positive or productive, maybe dealing with poverty or, or criminality or addiction and then expecting them to throw the switch the next day and work a nine to five job. Yeah. And, and they it, don't have any min- mentors but, on, on to do that. And, you know, there's, they, they don't have anybody to talk to on that or how to do it. And it's just, yeah, it, it's exactly. so sad. Transportation, housing. And so that really, um, you know, that, again, I think that's why law enforcement is such a crucial part of that conversation because we're the ones in the homes mm-hmm. and we're the ones that need to be talking to policymakers talking to the advocacy groups and goes, look, your, your intentions are pure. We get it. But there's also a very sad reality that we have to deal with if we really want to help people. 
So I know you've been trying to bring some attention to that through some social media efforts and mm-hmm. things like that. How How is that process going for you? It's been successful. So Douglas County was not unlike a lot of other communities in Nebraska and across the nation where there was a push to reduce the amount of secure juvenile detention beds um, in Douglas County. And through a lot of engagement with the county board, uh, we had to, well, heck, a lot of it was moms, mothers of crime victims, mothers of juveniles that had navigated the juvenile justice system. They, they had to get FaceTime with these policymakers and explain to people it's not as easy as what someone says. You can't simply solve juvenile detention rates by dropping juvenile detention capacity. Mm-hmm. Those are two different things. They're not mutually exclusive. And so um, we've, we've had success lately. Uh, we've had a majority of the county board that is taking a fresh eyes look at it. And actually in Douglas County now, I think in the region, now uh, our, our old Douglas County Youth Center had 144 bed capacity 132 operating capacity. Uh, now we've we've got essentially 200 uh, secure bed capacity, and so that means that that opens up a lot of options for the county board, and it opens up a lot of options for communities all across the uh, the region. But but here's the bigger issue: juvenile justice. It's a tough topic to talk about because it's kids, and everyone wants kids to do well. But it it's that same thing we just talked about a little while ago. If you come from historical poverty or historical crime issues or a family struggling with mental health and addiction, unless you truly get carefully designed structure, consistency, support, the chances are you're going to follow that same pattern. Mm -hmm. And so we've got, everyone's got to be on point, law enforcement, our service providers, the court system. If we're really going to help these kids, you can't just do that by letting them out easy we got to really give them the support and structure they need to thrive. Well, these kids aren't just going shoplifting in a Snickers bar either. No. Uh, last year in Douglas County in Omaha, one-third of our homicides involved a juvenile, either as the aggressor or the victim. Mm. And I can tell you, knowing many of those cases, if not most, most of those juveniles were already juvenile justice involved. Right now, Douglas sure. County is dealing with a bloom of auto thefts. Mm-hmm. I mean, just... We're, it's skyrocketing. We haven't seen numbers like this Lincoln's for same years. Way. Lincoln's now, same way. The majority of those suspects are juveniles. Many of those juveniles are repeat offenders that have been cycled in and out of the juvenile justice system. And again, you have to ask yourself, not only is that, is that good for the community? I would say no. Think about all the jobs and the families that have been disrupted by losing their car, especially maybe in families and they only have one car mm-hmm. to get to work. Is that good for the kids? Is it good for the kids to cycle these kids right in and out, to do it all over again, escalate? Because everyone knows, anyone who's been in law enforcement for a long time, the precursor to the drive-by shooting or the homicide is the stolen car. Sure. Right. right. Sheriff uh, Wagner, Lancaster County, perspective on that? Similar similar issues? Well, yeah, uh, Lincoln, Lancaster County, we're seeing increased auto thefts. 14, 15-year-old kids are out. Um, two or three or four in the morning rifling through cars that are unlocked, stealing cars that are, have the keys in them. And it's, uh, yeah, it's this year is, is more so than any year in the past. It's amazing. Well, I think what we're seeing is the juvenile justice reforms are really finally settling in and kids know we talk to them all the time. They know there's no consequences. That's correct. And, yeah. kids, and kids aren't dumb. I mean, they're, 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 their brains are forming. We know the science but they're also very perceptive and they know what works and what doesn't work and what our limitations are. That's exactly right. And we've, there's been a common theme here recently in Douglas County. The sad reality is we don't have appropriate alternatives to detention in Nebraska or Douglas County right now. Many of our alternatives to detention in Douglas County are being taken up by youth from the rest of the state Mm -hmm. because they're lower risk, their crimes are lower. And if you're a private contractor, if you're a private entity and you you pay your bills by bringing in kids, you're going to bring in lower risk kids than you would higher risk kids. That's just the reality. And there's no way we can force it's them to business, do otherwise. Business sense, yeah. But the other sad reality is other than detention for some of these high risk chronic kids, where do you put them where they just don't walk out of the facility again? Where do you put them where they just don't run away over and over and commit worse and worse crimes? And so I think 
that's the next thing our policymakers have to come to terms with. Can we create a almost like another Boys Town? You know, with various <clears throat> levels of supervision, various levels of security, to make sure that we put these kids in a facility that's commensurate with where they are right now and the help that they need. Let's move on. I know another another issue that, uh, that your administration is working on tackling is, uh, and, and you made the good point before we went on air, they belong together. So you've had some homeless encampment issues in the Douglas County area, but a lot of that's fueled by mental and behavioral health. Yeah, I'd say the vast majority of it. So, you know, everyone has seen what's happened in San Francisco. Everyone's seen what's happened in Portland and Seattle. And that is uh, the reason why they've had unbridled growth in homelessness and especially homelessness fueled by mental health and addiction is because they focused, in my opinion, too, too, too much on harm reduction. Mm -hmm. And they didn't counterbalance the harm reduction with the enforcement, the supervision piece. You know what I mean? Yep. Mm -hmm. The safety net piece. Because let's face it, if you're living in a tent under a bridge, surrounded by litter, if that's not your rock bottom, I don't know if you're ever going to hit it. Mm -hmm. And right. so I think that uh, we've got to come to terms with the fact that today's homeless, like what I just described, we're not talking the friendly vagabond with the, you know, the knapsack, the yep. knapsack, yeah. with, you know, the, the sandwich wrapped in a, in a rag on the stick and he's jumping on the train and playing the harmonica. That's not what it is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's we're, this essentially what we're seeing under our bridges, in our wood line, in our tree lines those folks would have been in inpatient treatment facilities had we not shut the majority of them down in the late 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And so we need to come to terms with that. We will never address, in my opinion, we'll never be able to address our homeless challenges by just pushing the problem around the city. Okay, great. We broke up this homeless camp under this, under this bridge. Um, great. They're going to go to the next bridge. Yeah, they don't just disappear. Right. And unless... One of two things, either our mental health uh, organizations have inpatient care to be able to help them out, get them healthy again, then transition them out in a safe way, or our criminal justice systems have carefully designed mental health uh, capabilities within corrections to be able to do the same, we're never going to get a handle on it. We need better infrastructure on both. So obviously public safety has a part to play in that, but... We, we are not treatment centers. We're not clinicians. Um, we're a Band-Aid. Yeah. It's really what we are in a lot of those situations when, the, you know, they get called and, you know, they're, they're doing whatever and they've committed a crime and things. But, you know, pushing it off on just to the cops to deal with this isn't going to be the answer. It takes care of the problem for a day maybe and then right. we're right back out and, and it's the same issues again. But I know your office has, has taken a little bit more of a proactive approach and, and this is something... That, that law enforcement agencies across the country are experimenting with. Talk to us about your um, your behavioral health unit and some of your community action teams, how that how that looks for them. Sure. So so we're very fortunate. We've got a sergeant on the sheriff's office who is a master's level educated um, uh, expert in, in behavioral health. And he actually, other than being a full-time sergeant, he, he teaches it at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, the interplay between law enforcement and behavioral health community. So we put him in charge of our new behavioral health unit, um, and he's got a variety of responsibilities that he's got to build. Number one, he's, he's got a civilian therapist co-responder who's been assigned to him. They're not as big as we'd like that unit to be. Eventually, we'd like to grow it to maybe mm -hmm. at least one deputy to help assist him. But we want him to essentially duplicate what the city of Omaha's behavioral health and wellness unit does be able to address those, uh, put out those brush fires out in unincorporated Douglas County and for the smaller communities in western Douglas County, how can we address the chronic 911 call individual that's clearly a behavioral health issue? How, mm -hmm. can we, how can we move their trend line in a downward direction, either by connecting them with appropriate services, staying in touch with them? We know the data shows that works mm -hmm. if you do that. So that's number one. Number two, um, I'm embarrassed to say we don't have a peer support program in Douglas County, in the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, for our own people. And so he's going to be tasked with designing and creating a peer support system because we can't help people if, if our people aren't healthy. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna, he's going to lead the charge on creating a peer support program. 
not only for the sheriff's deputies, but also for the smaller agencies that, uh, that are in Western Douglas County. Omaha has a great one. I was a part of it. I feel strongly about it. Issue number three is I really want him to grow that service to that board of mental health. Hmm. Um, we've had some great conversations with our chairman of the board of mental health, Mike McClellan. He's an attorney and he's a longtime chairman. Everybody agrees that where we're really missing opportunities is on that outpatient therapy for individuals that are under the supervision of the board of mental health. There is really no case management. Hmm. And how can we expect a nurse case manager to go under a bridge to assess someone under the board of mental health care or go into a tent village to find the person that they need to assess right. without having that arm of the court that, you know, a sheriff's deputy mm-hmm. to be able to help them do that safely. So I, I, I hope that as we move forward that we will see Douglas County can become that, that new model of really service to our board of mental health as well. Because if we, if we can really make inroads with folks, those highest risk folks that are struggling with behavioral health, you know, we, we can, we can resolve a lot of our problems, especially our high risk problems. Well, we certainly uh, applaud you for your efforts in that area. And, and again, something that we hope we can, we can kind of learn from and, and share some of your successes and uh, see what works and, and see what may work mm-hmm. in Lancaster County down the road. Well, the frustrating thing is Nebraska is one of the least funded for mental health in the United States. It, it's in the bottom five, and, and uh, everything costs money on these things to be able to make sure that we're doing these right and, and getting it done. So, mm-hmm. Well, and it's going to take a collaborative approach, too, because mm-hmm. we need our federal partners, our state partners. You know, you're fortunate. I don't know how much. I mean, I'm, actually, I'll ask you. I mean, your Lincoln Regional Center, the fact that you have it in Lancaster County, I'm sure, you know. Nope. It doesn't help us. That they're so full that we can't even get it's people so in. full. Okay. Yeah, we just so can't get people in there. But you know what? It's probably full of a lot of Omaha people. It could you be. Know what yeah. I mean? And so mm-hmm. we would love to, I'd love to see an Omaha Regional Center in the city of Omaha or in Douglas County to help take the pressure off of you. I, well, I think you hit the nail on the head, though. When they, you know, when they shut down the, the regional centers across the state, Hastings, Lincoln, Norfolk, um, and, and, and went to a community-based treatment program, I think everybody needs to take a state back now and say, you know what, that just, it, it's not working. For some people it works, but for the most chronic. Yeah, for the most chronic it doesn't. It doesn't. And, and um, You need an you're option. Having a, you're having a hard time finding service providers. And, you know, the, again, it, like Ben said, it takes money. You have to fund those things properly and, and really evaluate that and, and put the, the most chronic folks, they need to be, they need more intensive care than what they can get in an outpatient program. Well, even if you build the brick and mortar, then you got to find people to staff it. Right, yeah. and, and that's a whole other. That's, that's a whole tough job. Challenge. Yep. Yeah. And we didn't we didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of here You're overnight, exactly right. um, either. But uh, well, Sheriff Hanson, other any other closing thoughts today? No, I just really appreciate the partnership, and I know there's a long-standing history of partnership and collaboration between Douglas County and Lancaster County. That's that's only going to continue and, and continue to grow, and we really appreciate it. Well, and we, we appreciate you taking the time to, to come down to Lancaster County. It was nice to get 901 and 902 together. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, we'll hope to have you back and, uh, and, and maybe hear an update on how things are going in Douglas. Thank you for your time. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir.